Oh, hi everyone, how was dinner? You'll have to excuse me. Can everyone hear me okay? Yeah, okay, good. Well, hi Andy. Hey. I had to get into this. Yeah, it's gonna be fun. So when we were thinking about the themes of this week around biohacking and health and wellness and human performance, it was like, let's look no further than Dr. Andy Walsh. So he drove down the coast to be here. Thank you so much for being here. Oh, very welcome. No, thank you. Oh, thank you, everybody. I'm really excited to uh, listen to uh, some of the stories from the rest of the community here tonight. So I'll hopefully get through my stuff pretty quickly. <laughs> So this is going to be two parts. We're going to first get to hear about Andy's backstory. He's going to build his credibility, which you'll see he has quite a lot of when you've seen what he's done with his projects. And then we're going to get into our bodies. We're going to challenge ourselves a little bit. Not too much. We know everyone just ate. But um, you know he is one of the best in the world at helping people deal with stress under pressure. So we'll be doing a breath holding session. So we're going to give you a little time to digest while we talk. Um, so Mr. Walsh. Before we were working with uh, people like Phil Felix Baumgartner and uh, elite special forces and Cirque du Soleil and helping people run marathons in under two hours, you know, take us back. How did you first kind of set down this, this path? So, um, yeah, well, first disclaimer, I'm, I'm part of a community just like you all, and a lot of the stuff I'll share with you tonight is thanks to all the brilliant people I get to work with every day. So I'm going to try and channel all those minds. But, um, I was really fortunate, I was probably the, the classic, I wasn't good enough to be world class, so I became a coach. And in Australia, that's a, you can do a degree in coaching, a sporting country. And that just piqued my passion in how people uh, perform, how do people do extraordinary things. And what, what really blew me away back in the day, and this is you know, the late 80s, early 90s, in Australia we were recoiling from a miserable Olympic journey. Uh, we, we bombed out at the Montreal Games with about six medals, and that was a big kick in the teeth for the Australian sporting public. So the government got together and decided we'll turn that around for Sydney in 2000. I was part of that community, and we basically flew all the sports training coaches, nutritionists to one spot. We flew our, a couple of hundred athletes to one spot, the Institute of Sport, and we worked every day trying to figure out how to make them uh, better. So, and that was just, that's sort of where it all started. Wow. And I did read you, uh, your, one of your first gigs was working with uh, 30 kindergartners. Oh, wow, <laughs> you have done your homework. Yeah, uh, when you first train as a coach, one of the skills they're trying to get you to uh, uh, obviously master is how to organize people. And so they stuck me with uh, kindergartens at a school for uh, about a month, and I tell you, that uh, was <laughs> about the toughest crowd I've ever had. <laughs> I mean, I'll never forget the first day I got there and we, of course, they're in class all day and my job was to take them outside and do sports. And we opened the door and boom, they were gone. They were all <laughs> over the place. And, uh, but I tell you to this day, when I'm working with, you know, you know, Fortune 100, whatever CEOs, those skills I learned to manage those kids are what I use to manage the C-suite now. <laughs> so it comes full circle for you. <laughs> Um, so I first got to experience Dr. Walsh's work when I was uh, racing skier cross. So how many people know what skier cross is? Oh my God, one person, two people in the room. Okay. It's two. <laughs> so it's four ski athletes at the same time. At X Games, it's six. So imagine you're, you're standing at the top of the ski slope and there's these gates you stand in. The gates drop and it's literally first one to the bottom wins. You're racing head to head over these huge jumps and rolls and rhythm sections. It's essentially a motocross course on, on snow, right? And so I had a, a pretty dark moment in my career. Um, a good friend, unfortunately, hit a, a television pole when they were filming and um, sadly uh, passed away. And then a week after that, Sarah Burke, I don't know if any of you knew her, but she was that uh, beautiful half-pipe skier, hit her head in uh, uh, half-pipe in Park City and sadly passed away. A week after that, I had a, a minor in, uh, knee injury. And then a week after that, I got disqualified at the X Games super publicly over this clothing infraction. So it was, uh, it was a rough month. Um, I didn't think I wanted to ski again. I was terrified to ski. I thought something horrible was gonna happen to me. And so I got sent to the Center of Excellence in Park City. Um, Andy designed this place, and it was like walking into you know, the Willy Wonka factory for high performance. It was the first time I got to work with a sports psychologist and uh, learn about visualization and positive self-talk and meet with nutritionists and really clean my diet up. 
and then get really strong, right? I didn't even know how to you know, properly squat, so you gotta work with a lot of coaches like that. So Andy, I actually didn't even know he had designed this place until we were kind of prepping for this talk, so thank you for pulling me out of the dark. I not only you know, fell in love with skiing again, but I won the national title um, a few months yeah, later. Yeah. <laughs> it's a serious Sparta sport, ski across, so yeah, it's tough. I have a screw loose, is what my parents say. <laughs> So how do you even bring something like this to life? How do you think of the models of performance? So uh, in the performance director role, as a bit of backstory. Um, you, uh, your job is to sort of go to an organization, mostly it started in the athletic world, but it's expanded a lot from there uh, nowadays. And the job is to look at the talent in the organization and try and identify what it is they're trying to achieve. So model the performance and by modeling the performance in the ways we look at these models, and we can explain it a bit here, you're then trying to figure out what levers can you pull and manipulate to increase and improve uh, their potential. And so, and it, it covers everything. You know, the model you see on the screen here is very generic. It covers, a, so just to give you a sense of the, the breadth of the models, they get far more complex than this. But the facility in its own right in the best performing organizations in the world is modeled off the needs of the talent. So even what you're trying to achieve with the people every day, you then design the facility around those requirements. And as you said, there was nutrition and psychology and there was a skate ramp in there and a trampolines for the aerialists. And so that's how it comes to life. And that's, uh, that, that's the fun part about the job. Love that. So it looks like on the left are kind of the things we can't measure very well. And then on the right, um, some things we can. So kind of double clicking into nutrition, what did you find that you could share? Yeah, um, again, very full disclosure, these models are very specific. So you think about what you're trying to achieve and it can be any realm of mastery. You put yourself in the middle and then you put all those things around the outside that you think are gonna contribute to that performance. So again, generically speaking, we put these in those two buckets, but nutrition is really, uh, it's a challenging one for us because there's so much misinformation in the community. Even amongst the experts, there's a lot of disagreement. There's a quick test. Who here thinks coffee's good for them? <laughs> Who here thinks coffee's bad for them? Yeah. And you can pull up research that supports both your views. So it's, a, it's an interesting space. So what these models actually have to become is very what we call precision models. So we put that one person in the middle and we figure out how do they tolerate coffee? Is it good for them? Is it bad for them? How much can they have? How late can they have it? Is, it? is it helping them with their exercise? And we measure that. And we do that pretty much on all the different cogs and things you see around the outside there. So it, it, so it's, it, it's, it, it simplifies it for us sometimes, but it can also become very complex. Right. And we have really advanced tests across nutrition and things that uh, help us uh, juggle that a little bit. Take that. So. Uh, Andy got to work with each athlete at uh, US Ski and Snowboard on their own goals. So here we have, um, does everyone know who Sean White is? Yeah. Okay, amazing, good. You didn't know what skier cross is, but everyone knows Sean White. Sean White, yeah. <laughs> so Andy, talk to us about kind of making this with Sean and, and how you went through this. So the, the, the reason we threw that up there was to talk, if you're thinking about your own model, it's gotta become actionable. So whatever cogs or things you pick on the outside, whatever actionable items, you can see Sean here is preparing for 2010, Vancouver. And his model is very simple. And this is not his whole body, his whole performance model, but it's his performance model for winning in the Olympics. And you can see he's picked five things, competition, technical capability, physicality, life is a big one for him, and psychology. Now you may say that's obvious. What's really important to understand though is that he was such a talent that he recognized that if he could perform and, or practice these tricks and, and actually do these tricks, so the question to Sean is, Sean, if you can compete and perform these tricks on the day at the Olympics, will you win? He said, no one will touch me, I'm, wi I'm winning. So he picked these in his model, we I addressed that with training. Do any of you remember the big half pipe in Silverton up on the mountain in the middle of nowhere? That was the, that was the PR campaign around, that was, that was Sean's pipe. But what's also really important is you've got to trade things off. And as you can see here, you can't do everything well all the time. And that's a big mistake. A lot of people getting into the business, I've got to be good at everything. There's just no chance in hell. We're maxing out the training volume for these talents. And so you've got to pick and you've got to trade off. You're going to do a, spend a bunch of time getting good at uh, the tricks. And Sean could 
he doesn't need to be as strong. He doesn't need to be as fit because he's so technically competent he can get away with it. So it's always a trade-off. And his family and things are also, he has them as medium, but uh, it was really important to him that he actually had them on the list. So that, that, was, that was good to see. So just an example of how you design a performance model around a particular craft. Could be anything, as I said, nowadays we put anyone in the model. And then you pick the things that are important and then you just go out and you start to chip them off the block. Right, um, okay, so that's US ski team and snowboard. So on to Red Bull. On to Red Bull. <laughs> on to Red Bull. So you're working with a lot of non-traditional athletes. Your brake dancers, your rally car racers, freestyle motocross, um, typically very unfunded sports, right? So I imagine those athletes are not lacking motivation, right? Because no. they've had to get to where they are, making their own training programs, building ramps in their backyards as five-year-olds. I, I can um, bet. So what are these athletes coming to you to do? Can you give us uh, maybe an example? Well, they're coming to you with some crazy ideas, let's put it that way, Red Bull. So I had a, we had about 1,000 athletes in 170 sports, so you can imagine that thought process across there. We also had about 3,000 artists, musicians, designers, uh, DJs, and they were also part of the program, not to the same extent. But typically their job as athletes, as talent, was to imagine the future of their sport. What's next? And it's very important to recognize that the talent always will tell you what's coming. You can sit around and hypothesize as a coach or try and imagine what's going to be the next biggest thing in that particular field. But the easy solution is just to ask the talent, and the talent always knows. So um, the beauty of working at Red Bull is they're non-traditional athletes, and in our world, the more experience you have with different types of people trying to achieve greatness, the more stories you see and more lessons you learn, more mistakes are made, the more you build your database. So Maddo comes along one day, and he was driving through Vegas, and he drove past the fake Arc de Triomphe that's there on the strip, and he, he literally, this is, he comes into our office one day and he goes, you know, I think I can jump a motorcycle on top of that. <laughs> and back then we didn't really have many lawyers involved, so I was like, yeah, let's go. <laughs> Here we go. That's what it looked like. Well, Joe, I have to tell you that That's his wife. She's faking it. She's terrified at that moment. He nailed that one. The sweet spot we talked about. He made it look so easy. What's crazy for this event is you ride off blind. You can't see the jump. Now he's trying to find third gear. Because he goes off in second, he'll somersault. He goes off in fourth, he won't stop. You can tell he's a little nervous because he's still searching for third gear and for Matto that's like second nature but he's not taking any chances. So he's still looking, he's double check, double check. <laughs> Alright, I got it. He actually tore the webbing, he tore his thumb off, ripped through his hand there, but you don't see that on the TV. God. So how did Robbie even start to train for this? So this is great. This is New Year's. The, I think we timed it to drop with the clock in New York, so it's not uh, 8 o'clock or 10 o'clock in Vegas, whatever that relationship is. And uh, he had to perform on the spot. So everyone looks at Red Bull and goes, ah, oh, the kids just turn up and go. So there's about 12 months of prep into this, and we basically had to build a facility just to train and practice for this. And this is in the buckets have never been done before. So in, in those particular programs, there's a whole process you go, if you're trying to do something that's never been done before, there's a slightly different approach, but it fundamentally comes down to developing the skill to uh, execute on cue in front of thousands of people on television, you know? So it's, it's fundamentally the same process, it's just the technical side is, I gotta jump up 110 feet. So I think um, we have a, a clip, actually, of what you guys did. For so us. this is what it looks like. And what happened, and the, even that little hump's interesting because <laughs> we couldn't go any further out for the runway 
in Vegas because we would have been on the, on the road. So we had to give him a little extra kick start. So that was at the end of the car park, that distance. And so that little ramp gets him going. And then you can see him practicing. And he comes back down. So, <laughs> so you're constantly raising that platform, right? Because right, yeah, if you press the button one more, you'll see the sort of basic principles behind it. But that's a sound stage, actually. And there's a massive foam pit. A foam pit's bigger than this building behind it. Um, so fundamentally, we started at you know, incremental steps. So if you think about any skill in the world, any, anything you're trying to achieve, if you follow five basic principles, you'll get better at it. Now, it's up to you how you want to manipulate those, but if you're motivated, of course, he's fired up. He's not, he's, he brought the idea to us. You've got to give people a chance to practice, and that sounds so straightforward, but give them a chance. Practice at 10 feet, practice at 10 feet. What most people don't get right is they don't progress. They achieve a certain level, they run around the block, they run 5K and they stop. The body will adapt very quickly, so you actually have to keep giving it a little bit more of an edge. And so we raised it 10 feet. I got that 10 feet, got another 10 feet, another 10 feet. Um, feedback, so of course, your body will adapt in the direction that you reinforce the learnings. So to learn a new skill, you give feedback, so we filmed it and showed him every day. And, and then finally, for anything that's never been done before, it's hypercritical that you can make a lot of mistakes. So we've set up with safety there, it's not quite as clear, and we probably could have put a bit more safety in it, but the reality is he can go long, he can go short, he can fall his foam all around the bottom there. And this was at the end of the training, but he can make mistakes and learn, and just make a mistake and learn, and make a mistake and learn. And as long as we set up that structure, you can do anything in the world, even extraordinary things like this. So it's, it's just a, if you don't get this right in your training, the rest of the stuff you can pro try and do is a waste of time. Heard it here. Okay, this maniac, um, Austrian, Felix <laughs> Baumgartner. Does ever, did everyone see this? Do you remember this? He wanted to be the first human to break the sound barrier. So Andy, <laughs> what was it like working but, with Felix and kind of designing this yeah. wild idea? So this was, a, this, was a, this was a longer haul. This was a seven year project. Um, and there was, there was a lot going on. But again, Felix had watched an old movie. The, if you ever see the old historical footage of the astronaut program in the US, it started with a guy called Joe Kittinger him and a dozen mates letting a balloon up out in the desert here in, in New Mexico and going up to about 80, 90,000 feet, I think it was, and you know, jumping off, just like that, back in the 60s, 50s actually. He saw that and said, I can do that. And so his goal was and to be the highest free faller in, 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 in history. And you know, part of the deal of that would be you, you're falling so far, there's no atmosphere, you're gonna break the speed of sound, et cetera, et cetera. So again, the athlete came up with the idea and decided it was a, he told the boss. <laughs> and the boss said, yeah, good to go. Unfortunately, yeah, lots of things happened along the way which got in our way. But again, it was in the never been, full, never been done before bucket. So we had to build a framework around it for that. So talk to us about what we're seeing. Oh, oh we might have lost that one. You go press it back maybe. Back. Now press it once, the green. I'll just leave it there, okay. there we go. So you're, what you're seeing here is our view from mission control. You can see his heart rate's at a buck 75 there, his respiration, he's at 128,000 feet. There's a lot going on, but if you check out that little dial on the left that's sort of scrolling up from 0 0.9 to 11 to 12, that's the mark. So when that hits mark, when that hits one, he's at the speed of sound. And then that bottom right is a little accelerometer on his finger. If it goes outside that outer ring for more than three seconds, he's dead. And that's because you get into a flat spin and all the blood rushes to your brain will kill you. So we're watching that one pretty closely as well. And as you can see, he starts to spin a little here. Right on the edge, oh, he's back in. Back in, back in. It has to stay out there. So if it comes back in, you recover. 
But basically the idea of this video is hyper-technical. New oxygen systems, new uh, flight control systems, the whole thing had to be built from scratch, it had never been done before. And those who followed the journey of Felix, he was very brave in that he, he kind of owned the fact that he had a, had a nervous breakdown a couple during the event. And part of the challenge was to get him through that sort of dark time of his sort of uh, uh, journey in, the, in, this, in this project and move him through it. And through the help of lots of great experts, we were able to navigate that space. And like anything, finally lucky, he, at the end of the video, he lands safely. Um, but the reality was we had missed a lot and we'd been so buried in the technology and the tech side of the program, which was significant, don't get me wrong. Um, but we'd lost sight of the human in the loop and it was a great reminder to us that, you know, we've got to recenter that model back on the human. And so there's a lot to unpack there uh, and happy to chat to anybody later, but the reality was we then took our training, all our training evolutions that we have, or our training modules or whatever lessons you might call them, and we have the best, we have hyper-advanced nutrition and science and wearables and sensors and well, we can do anything to anybody. But we hadn't trained people for that really powerful moment when things go completely wrong, when things go pear-shaped, when things aren't going according to plan. And we realized we'd missed that in his development. And I came in a little later, not to say, yeah, we we're all involved, but part of it was how do we take our training evolutions up a notch so that we incorporate those elements alongside the science and technology. And that led to the birth of uh, what we call Project Acheron, which is uh, uh, this, this little uh, this sort of precursor here. Yes, and, and real quick on Felix, I was reading that Michael Gervais, his sports psychologist, mm -hmm. put himself in Felix's suit, right? Mm -hmm. To see you know, like. how claustro you know, claustrophobic it was, because wasn't he just terrified to even look at his suit? By it the got to the point where the suit, where the suit was challenging. I think there was a lot more going on, but the reality was the suit itself became a trigger for a lot of other things. And if you get in that, remember, it's, it's not <laughs> common knowledge for obvious reasons. To go to that altitude in a spacesuit, you actually have to flush your entire body of, uh, uh, of carbon dioxide. You pre-breathe. You breathe for six hours, O2, before we can take you up. So all those fighter pilots and that you see, that, they have to go through all that beforehand. So you sit there like this, with the, in the mask, sit down, and you're just breathing and letting your body flush. Brutal. And if you're even the slightest bit anxious about being in closed spaces, it's not the thing. The funny part about that is, that in the Air Force, if you don't pass that first uh, suit test they, they give you, if you're gonna be a high altitude pilot, you're gone. Wow. We had to have permission off the Air Force to do the event. You don't, it's funny, you can't fly things above America without the Air Force being involved, go figure. <laughs> but the reality is, <laughs> um, they said he should be gone, and we said, well, you select and deselect based on that characteristic, which is great when you have 100 people lined up. We only have one. So we've got to get the person who's not ready to get them ready. And the, I remember trying to get the general to agree to us and he's like, all right, I, you'd see he was gonna give us enough rope to hang ourselves. But the reality was that training and learnings that we had to develop to get him through that became now operationally for the Air Force because then they can say, well, if the person fails the first time, maybe they just need a little practice versus you fail once you're gone. So it became a really, uh, uh, an interesting point in the program, and it, but it was, yeah, you know, it's not easy to sit in that suit. Oh my God, no, I would fail. <laughs> so Project Acheron, how did, how did you uh, decide on that name? Yeah, so, so what's hard in these videos, and this is a Red Bull video, so it's more flash and bang and sizzle, is the backstories, the nuance, all the things that are actually layered. So, as we get more sophisticated with the talent, we need more sophisticated training evolutions to match the talent. And that's on every level, from the science to the design to the, to the review to the preparation. So you want to have so many layers to these training evolutions that when you pull them apart, the athlete's discovering or people are discovering stuff. So Acheron, who's familiar with Dante's Inferno, the poem, allegory, does anyone know what Acheron is? Maybe I shouldn't just explain before asking. Acheron's fundamentally that r the river that before you pass into heaven or hell, you have to cross, but it's lined with souls who can't commit. So it's great on the surface, it sounds like a funky name, but as people dig, they start to realize, and the whole, it sort of epitomizes the whole training, because there's probably 
the kicking the hell out of them version that you see here <laughs> that then goes deeper and deeper and deeper and you can keep peeling. So there's probably about a dozen to 15, 17 layers of different training intention. And we don't care if someone comes in at the, I just want this crap kicked out of me level, or if they, but if they're inquisitive as most of these people are, as they start to unpeel it, they go and read the poem, they go and look at the other layers that we put in and, they, and it starts to have a compounding effect on their training and development. All right. Here's a little clip. Respect the country, it will respect you back. Look after it, it will look after you. Become one with it. No matter where you go, the spirit of the country will follow you. There's always something there. Take them out, teach them, push them, follow them and keep them safe. They'll finally realize what they're missing make them learn who they are. I want to challenge myself. Really push myself to what I think are the limits and find new ones. Red Bull is basically trying to take us out of our element and to push us in different ways and teach us something that we can take back to our sport or back to life. It's going to be an experience that no one else on this earth has ever experienced or something totally different out of the realm of your world. I have no idea what we're doing. I didn't really try to find out. You know, I'm in it for the experience, so bring it on. It's not a set trail, a set path, and it's not something that we as guides or we as the leaders are completely familiar with. We're experiencing it with them. Project Akron is really a physical, spiritual, emotional challenge that we've crafted to take athletes who are already great at what they do and see if we can move them to that next level in their chosen field. This science of the brain and understanding how people really perform at their very best is really the bigger conversation we're trying to crack into. As I said, a little Red Bullish, but uh, so to give you a little context, to train people for the unknown, which is a big part of doing the never been done, you have gotta put them in places where they don't have all the answers. So the girls didn't even know what country they were going to, so we rip them out, pack them up, drop them in the middle of the nowhere, and then they have to figure it out. And then that particular journey was designed to move them through we look at the planet at night and we figure out the darkest places and that's where we want to take you. And then, um, <laughs> and there's just layers and layers along there. So uh, yeah, there's a lot going on. So what were some uh, takeaways that you saw, some changes in the athletes from that? So as I said, one of the things is important, especially when you're working with talent, you can't, you, you can play with some stuff on the edge, but you have to also be confident what you're doing has a positive impact. And so we, everyone went through a, a functional MRI before they left and post. So one of the changes we actually measured was the brain changed dramatically over, over 15, 12, 15 days. So we always knew that if you get the training and the environment right, the body will adapt and adapt really quickly. We'd just never been measured before and we showed that they were able to handle more stress and tolerate more. They were more acute to fear and fear, but they were able to handle more fear and fear. And so we really saw that shift there. Um, on the other end of the spectrum, one of the happiest sort of moments of my career has been when we do these types of events and the parents call me up and, and Jordan's dad, Darren, just, hey, Andy, she's a different person, a oh. different woman. Um, and then even the kids of Greta's, Greta's kids say they talk about mum before she went and mum after. There's two different mums they have. Mm. So you can measure everything, the bloods and all the rest of it, but sometimes it's just the purely 
reflections on the things that can't be measured, <laughs> who they are as a human, that really give you impact. And, and, and it was tough, it was challenging because they're, they're talented. So you, you, it's, it's, you sort of tune the whole thing to suit the purpose. Oh, wow. Okay, so this is a bit of, um, of the work you're doing now. Can you kind of talk, is this a bear? What is going on in the all grizzly. these slides? <laughs> So Bart's an old friend of ours. We've used him a lot. We had him run through a campsite with a bunch of talent one time in, in, when we were in Montana. He's the bear that you saw in uh, Legends of the Fall and all that. He's the, he's the Hollywood bear. He has a SAG card, you know. <laughs> he's, not, he's, not, he's, he's pretty cheap except for the amount of chicken he eats every day. <laughs> so in this particular case, some uh, uh, endurance athletes uh, from community in New York were brought out and they're obviously from a city, so what do you do? You put them in, not a city, this is in Utah, and you're just walking them along in the woods and obviously they're blindfolded. They know we're up to something. It's, it's like they know we're training, but we just don't say anything. And they're quietly walking along in the woods in Utah and then they hear this, you know. We give Bart a few prides and make him make a few noises. And so the training evolution is simply to reflect on yourself, reflect on your own triggers and your own emotion and try and down-regulate yourself. So slow your breathing, because you can hear something big in front of you. And then of course, when we take the blindfold off, the trigger goes up again and then you've got to bring it back down. And then depending on how, you know, how the per and people are always, we're always judging how their response is. We're not out to do anything cruel. So everything is about a duty of care, but if, they, if, they, if they're matching up and they're stepping into it, then we'll get behind them and they'll stand in front of Bart and he's a couple of thousand pounds and then uh, his coach just taps the back of his ear and Bart will stand up on his hindquarters and sort of put <laughs> his arms out and he'll kind of open his jaws and things. And so you're trying to keep your shit together the whole time, fundamentally, and you learn. The trick is you learn how to do it. And what's beautiful about those evolutions is you learn that what you've learned in that experience you remember forever. And I have tons of people talk about that. One time you did that thing to us, every time I'm under pressure, I remember that and I, I remember how to train for it. Uh, we're doing a lot of work nowadays with founders, uh, startups. There's a whole unique way, when you think about a founder, many of you are, um, um, the idea that you're preparing the business models, the marketing plans, the communication strategies, but who's training you to deal with the ups and downs? Who's training you to actually deal with the stress of failure? So that whole part is typically missed. But if you ask all the investors, what fails? Well, the team fails. So there's a big opportunity now to look at founder health and wellness, but focus on like a more of a high performing outcome than a survival outcome. So thrive under the stress versus survive. Uh, that's a group of cyber athletes. So cyber warriors, so cyber comp, so hackers, getting a different taste of that. And then of course, the arts is extraordinary. The, the Skrillex there was part of a program and doing the artistic communities even even, even though it doesn't look as exotic in terms of the challenge of jumping out of a space, exposing your deepest insights and, th and thoughts about yourself and, your, your, and, and, your, and your, your community on stage in front of people is a very, very vulnerable space to be in. So helping them understand how to navigate adversity and threat through the same principle. They love actually doing the fun stuff allows them to explore more deeply and get them training because most of them are just trying to survive. And you'd be surprised how many of the top musicians in the world are terrified of being on stage, hmm. which is crazy to me. So how can we help you get, you should be loving that up there. I'd love it, yeah. <laughs> okay, well, the buzzword of, of every industry is, is AI. Andy, yeah. where, where do you see kind of AI influencing human performance? Yeah. Um, so for us, our most advanced work in the team space is obviously high-performing teams. So as you all know, getting a team of humans to work together is bloody hard. Add a machine into the mix now, see so human and machines, and it's infinitely more complex. It's fundamentally the same issue, trust. Do I trust you? you do you have my back? I, yeah, I, I do trust I you. Do. Same with the machine. Do I trust what it's telling me I should be doing? or not, you know, the number one cause of accidents in airlines is people ignoring the f machine. So the reality of this human machine teaming is, is sort of the future of where most of the high performing organizations in the world are trying to understand. How do I bring the best of a human together with the best of the machine to give me a competitive advantage? And it sounds rudimentary and straightforward, but the machine's getting so damn good at so many things 
it's actually a moving target. And the reality of that is, in that environment, and probably how to make it real for you all as a group, think about when you engage with a machine, like probably chat GPT or mid-journey or maybe something more advanced depending on your backgrounds. Ask yourself, what do you bring to that equation? What can you bring to the engagement with the agent or the AI or the machine, whatever you want to call it, to bring the best out of both of you? I thought. And that's the question we're dealing with, at, you know, all up the chain. Um, does anyone have any thoughts on that, that question? Yes, please, I can't see, but... I But I would ask you then, what is the innate human skill behind that curation? Feeling really dictates that narrative, and I think that we can pull those strings those heartstrings still, like a harp, in a way that the machine cannot do yet. And so that was what we found when we presented the campaigns as a side project, was the ones that were the most moving emotionally and consciously were still the ones who had the experience and had that alignment with that emotional intelligence where they could curate that story in that way. Beautiful. So listening, you can hear the emotion, the intelligence. So what humans innately can do well and what a machine can't do is the safe space right now. So things like empathy, compassion, experience, wisdom, experience and lessons. Uh, the idea that the true innate things that make us human are now becoming the probably the biggest challenge we have with respect to training and development now because they're the things now we're focusing on with the best people in the world. The machine's gonna do everything else. So funnily enough, we're going full circle back to our ancient systems of compassion, empathy, tolerance, intuition. We're trying to figure out how to accelerate. And we're talking about extreme intuition and extreme empathy. But the biggest one that we're working with right now is creativity. So our top performing groups in the world, we're, they're fit enough, they're strong enough, they eat well enough, no, nothing more, well, little bits to be gained. But the massive open space is how to think differently, how to gain a competitive advantage by reimagining what's possible. And imagineering is becoming, at the very highest levels, the most deeply asked for and trained element. So even the people you wouldn't think, government, military, engineering, they need to do all the rest of it, but now we're, tr we're exposing, exploring training and creativity. I'm so glad you're doing that. I always joke when I started working at Summit that all y'all were way crazier than the action sports athletes I knew. With <laughs> just like the risk you all take and the passion you bring to your companies and your ideas. So I'm excited for you. Uh, no, it's fun. So we have a little clip on creativity. So this is our latest training video. This is what it looks like now for us in human performance. And
music makers, and we are the dreamers of dreams. So it's really a wonderful time. These top executives, leaders, military admirals are sitting in. This is the start of the creative leadership where they're trying to reimagine and reconnect back to these sorts of things, the emotion, and think about their worlds differently. So it's, it's really a, an extraordinary time to be in our business. Mm. Now the fun begins. <laughs> so we have talked it up. Um, you know, we touched on a bunch of concepts and again, happy to unpack anything for you uh, later. But uh, the summit as they do, would love to see if you could practice a little bit. So it says summit sleepover, breath hold pup. So it's a breath hold performing under pressure program, which if any of you saw any, the surf survival was the original name, but it was a little harsh for a lot of people. Um, so it's a modified version of that. But this program, was designed originally from the model for big wave surfing. So big wave surfing, as it evolved and evolved, things got bigger and bigger. We obviously, one of the things you have to learn is how to hold your breath. <laughs> uh, and funny enough, they never trained it. So we, thanks to Ian, and I'll show you a quick clip here of Ian. Ian was on a flight from Hawaii to LA and he said, Andy, I saw this idea on free diving. And I said, free diving is great, but the idea with free diving is you're super relaxed, you're super chill and everything's down regulated. You're getting thrown off these waves 50, 60 feet high. You're not down regulated, so we've got to modify it a little bit. So the next clip you'll see him ex exploring what it means to be a big wave surfer and some of the ideas and things that sort of we spoke about today as a setup. The feeling when I got to the channel was just kind of antsy. Yeah, you're waiting to see what the day will hold. Ian Walsh didn't catch that many waves, but the ones he caught were the bombs. My morning started, like I said, we got out there and instead of watching it, we figured we'd just tow into a couple to warm up. And my first wave, I was a little bit too deep and I tried to do these three pumps as I pulled into the barrel. And on the third one, when I was in the barrel, I purled from the wave sucking up so much and I just did a cartwheel through the barrel, head over heels, got whipped and then I had held on it for a pretty long time, and right when I popped up, I saw Jamie Sterling pulling in this huge barrel that was just unloading like 10 feet in front of me. And I got blown into the lagoon, and I couldn't really swim. I had two life jackets on, and I got drug over the reef into the lagoon, and then I was pretty much warm and ready. <laughs> it was really crowded, so we were just kind of trying to be patient and only go on good waves, not really waste our time on the smaller ones that everyone was trying to battle for. You never know how big it could really be out there. You don't know if you the swell didn't peak or it peaked overnight or if it's going to peak at noon. So I'm just kind of anxious. That's the feeling. On a big day, we don't really care to go for a million waves. We're not here for that. We want to try to get the wave of the day. The next wave was pretty much the best wave of my life. I thought it was a decent sized wave. I didn't think it was going to be like a gigantic wave or anything. The water was pulling so hard off the reef, and you're going against the grain, so it just feels like it's yanking you up the face, and you just gotta hold your line. So I just leaned as hard as I could into my heels, and I could, as it started to barrel when I was going into it, I remember it getting all dark. It felt like I was in the shadow of it. It felt pretty tall, but I didn't, couldn't really tell how tall it was. And I remember right when I made the turn in the barrel, and it just felt like I could fit like a school bus next to me. And then I saw from there the shock wave like shot up and was like hitting the back of my foot. That, I thought the wave was just gonna pass me by and eat me and the foam ball was just gonna like annihilate me. You could die, but that's gonna, you wanna try to keep that in the back of your mind, not really in the front. <laughs> you're just stoked you made it and you're that close to falling. And those are always the best waves of your life when you think, you're not gonna make it. You're like, oh, I'm too deep, I'm too deep, I'm too deep. And then you take a different line and the foam ball hits you and shoves you out. And that, that surprise is what makes it the best way of your life. I was happy. <laughs> 10 years ago, people would have saw a photo of that wave and thought, no way, that's even rideable. So what's going on there is more of a description of the whole package. That's the performance. So the performing under pressure evolutions and training that we do are all bits and pieces of that overall performance. What's extraordinary about Ian there, and he, he does the whole thing, is he falls on the first wave of the day. 
and then he goes out and does that. So try and imagine yourself being on your biggest stage with the whole world's watching and your reputation and everything else and money, everything's on the line and you screw up. Most people run away and you know, tuck tail for another day. But his mindset is that, no, that's what I learned. I, he says, I was warmed up. Uh, but he's learning, he's listening. He's, I, didn't make, I didn't fail, I made a mistake that I can learn from. So that's the bigger message here today. Uh, the other message is that, and if we get to the next slide, is that we learn very quickly that the key to all of this, of bringing your best self forward whenever you need to, requires a deep level of self-awareness. And that self-awareness in this particular case is uh, knowing what brings the best out of you, knowing what scares you, knowing what uh, allows you to become, uh, push yourself through those moments. So the idea of training for it means you have to put yourself in scenarios where you feel a little bit of a challenge. If you want to get better at doing hard things, you've got to put yourself in spaces where you get to do hard things. But the key is to pay attention to what you're thinking, saying, and, and recognize where you are on those triggers. So you've all seen this curve before, it's over-talked, but it's fundamentally the mechanism you're trying to manage. So the old yerkes dodson curve means performance on the left and arousal, or you could call it stress or excitement at the bottom. And the human body, by design, and this is a, you know, hundreds of thousands of year old design, well, requires a optimal amount of, of stress to get the best performance out of you. Now, there's nothing wrong with being on the bottom left. That's where you recover, you regenerate, you relax. You've got to bring it down. If you can never bring it down, if you're always running hot, then you've got no room to move. So you've got to learn how to rest and recover and sleep and all those sorts of things. On the flip side though, if we put too much pressure on you, too much stress, you're going to fail. The idea is to be in the middle. So the trick today, and what we learned from the breath hold exercise is that it's, it allows us to put a little bit of stress on you. You're holding your breath, so who are you talking to? Yourself. Not a trick question, yourself, yeah. You're talking to yourself. <laughs> you're holding your breath, so you're talking to yourself. All you need to do as a training evolution is pay attention to how you respond when it gets hard. There's no judgment, it's not good or bad. Some people naturally can do this, others can't. It doesn't really matter. It's the trick of learning how you respond when things are going badly so that you can get ahead of it. And the trick to bringing yourself back down is what? What's the fundamental, what's the most effective trick to reduce stress in the human system? Breathe. Breathe. Slow breathing. Now, people argue different types, doesn't matter. Slow the breathing, the heart rate slows, the system slows down. So. What we found with the breath hold was, it was great to obviously train our big wave surfers. It became a self-awareness training tool that every member of our community goes through now. Now, if you want to hold your breath for 10 minutes, great. If hold, break a world record, but just the, the, the tool of putting yourself under a little challenge with a primal fear, so you'll feel, the, you know, as you start to feel like you run out of air, you, and then you, you, you start to navigate that space. So you're just walking up that curve. And all, all tonight, what we wanna do is just pay attention to what you're saying to yourself as things get a little hard. That's all the exercise is. So the next slide. All right, how long? Who here in the room can hold their breath for a, a seven or eight minutes? Hands up. Seven or eight minutes? Someone at the back said yes. All right. Six, put your hands up. Five, four, three, two, one, 30 seconds. I think we got, everybody's got to have 30 seconds here, okay? <laughs> All right, that's normal. People who've trained and practiced it naturally extend it. People who haven't are gonna think about 30 to 40 seconds. So when we do the breath hold camp, we want you to learn how to train in the static, which we'll do tonight, but then we can also take you out in the ocean and do some down -rigging. So you'll see here, and you can play it, the girls and, and us training down to about 100 feet, but you can measure how much better you're getting at it by how far depth you're going. And then eventually the evolutions get to the point where you come up for a breath and we have dive as we pull you back under before you get your breath and it gets, it gets a little crazy. But the wonderful thing about all these evolutions is that you're just, trying to participate in activities, but at the same time, you're also trying to down-regulate. 
So that's a free diving evolution, but it gets, as I said, more complicated. But after two or three days of that, with the breath hold on the floor, which you'll do tonight, and then a little bit in the pool, and then that's the next one, and then a little bit in the ocean, that's what happens over three or four days of improvement. So did they get fitter? Nope, not in three days. They get stronger? Nope. Did their diet help them? Nope. What changed? Mindset, simple as that. Mindset based on education and awareness. So, let's do it. Who's ready?